Hey everybody, Marshall here to share some really cool news with you. I, I trust at this point you've all heard about fake yeast. This is that Norwegian ale strain that can ferment cleanly at temperatures as high as, no joke, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 38 degrees Celsius. Absolutely crazy stuff. Well, last year, Imperial Yeast dropped A43 Loki, their Kvake strain, as a seasonal release, which meant we all had a pretty small window to get our hands on some. Not anymore. Imperial Yeast recently announced they're making A43 Loki a year-round strain due to popular demand. They're excited about it. I'm super excited about it. I've had some amazing beers fermented with Loki at terrifyingly warm temperatures. It is amazing stuff. Go grab some A43 Loki and see what all the fuss is about for yourself. When people think of beer, I have to imagine uh, one of the first things that comes to mind is hops, malt, yeast, which is unsurprising seeing as these are the main drivers of flavor. Funny thing is, altogether, they make up less than 10% of any given beer's total constitution. The rest is water, an ingredient that has a history of receiving perhaps the least amount of attention of all of the beer ingredients. You're listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and joining me in this episode to talk about the rather specific topic of reverse osmosis water in brewing is contributor Matt Del Fiaco. Yeah, and reverse osmosis gets a lot of talk specifically because, like you mentioned, like water is a, is a huge part of a beer and like ultimately drives a lot more than just the flavor profile, but it contains yeast nutrients. It helps promote enzymatic action via some of these minerals. Um, and as like brewers are trying to fine tune their recipes, we start looking at the water and like what goes into it and how that ultimately changes the end result of our beer. And RO water, uh, or reverse osmosis water, is essentially a almost a blank slate yeah. for us to kind of work from with our different mineral additions in order to fine tune and you know it's consistency it is uh it is you know changing the beer to your palate there's a lot that goes into it but uh reverse osmosis has been like a big th- uh, is is kind of that next step that a lot of people take when they start doing their water stuff and yeah. i see it almost more frequently than people like using just their municipal water and i think that has some interesting complications and considerations so I, it's going to be a fun one to talk about it's a little more complicated i think than i I had initially anticipated, which I love. Like, I love seeing all the rabbit holes that open up. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm lucky enough at my house to have uh, very good water. It's basically a blank slate anyways. Low chlorine, low chloramines. However, a little over a year ago, uh, the plant that usually supplies my water to my home, I think I've mentioned this in past episodes, they turned off uh, my water supply plant. Uh, for main, for annual maintenance, and it was down for three about three months or so, which meant I began receiving water from uh, the plant that serves the folks south of me, which is much harder, upwards of about 400 mm. TDS, total dissolved solids. So I, I went out and I bought an RO filter, and boy, did it make a difference. Well, if you want to make a difference by helping us to continue making this here podcast, consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy, where for a small monthly pledge, you'll receive rewards like unpublished uh, contributor recipes, unique discounts at Yakima Valley Hops, and an invite to a monthly live Q&A session with someone cool in the brewing world. Boy, do we have a good one next month. Man credited with introducing Kvake Yeast to the masses, European beer researcher and blogger Lars Marius Garshall. Uh, it, I, I'm so excited for this one. Matt, I know you're a big fan of of Loki and the uh, the Kvik thing. Lars is going to be fantastic. My wife is from, her whole family is from Latvia, uh, which is one of the three Baltic countries over there. Uh, and they've got a really interesting beer culture that I know Lars has looked into and researched. It's going to be a good one. All past sessions are available for new members to go back and view at their own leisure. Uh, you can learn more about being rewarded for your support over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. All right, feedback this week is brought to you by Brewers Hardware, who have everything you need to deck your brewery out from super convenient products like the quick clean take apart ball valve, uh, which turns any standard NPT port into an easy to clean tri clamp valve, uh, all the way to electric controllers like the BCS 482 that allows for full brewery automation. If you need it, they've got it. Go check them out at brewershardware.com. And don't forget to mention Brewlosophy at checkout to receive a free gift. That's brewershardware.com. Jackson Davis from Louisiana is one of many people who uh, who's reached out expressing interest in getting involved in the type of experimentation we're doing here at Brewlosophy. Jackson said, I've been brewing for a few years and I'm totally obsessed. Uh, welcome to the fold, by the way, Jackson. We all kind of feel that way, I think. Uh, I've already done some experiments 
experimenting and wanted to ask if there's anything I can do to help y'all out. Uh, so th th this is a question again that I get asked quite a bit and my current response is that we're all good on contributors right now. However, I do wanna encourage everyone out there who has any interest in performing experiments to do it. Not only because it's a ton of fun, but it contributes to the community. Uh, now, if, if you're going to do it and you'd like to have the opportunity to see it published on brewlosophy.com, you can go join the brew club, totally free. Uh, and the members collaborate with us on a monthly experiment. Uh, it's a fun little project that we do. You don't have to, you, you know, you don't have to deal with my bull crap. You get to deal with the folks in the brew club and, and have your article published on the website. Uh, even if you don't join the club, though, have some fun experimenting and please don't forget to share your results. All right. If you have show feedback, you can send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com. Leave us a voice message by calling 951-444-0320 or drop us a note on social media. A few years ago, I did something really stupid. Uh, I transferred some leftover work from a batch I just brewed to a plastic pitcher, put a fabric filter over it uh, to keep bugs out, and then I placed that pitcher of wort in my front yard during the heat of summer. I think it was about 105 degrees outside Fahrenheit uh, to try to ca capture some wild yeast. The following morning, I left it out overnight. I poured the presumably inoculated wort or beer, whatever it was at this point, into a flask, and I let it sit for a few days. Lo and behold, fermentation did happen. I was pretty excited. I then pitched that yeast into a small batch of wort and was surprised it actually fermented. After a couple of weeks, I bottled the beer, let them carbonate, and served them to unsuspecting friends. It was absolutely horrendous, and uh, that was the last time I tried that weird, silly, uh, uh, you know, capture my own wild yeast approach. Well, homebrewer Ian Antons recently sent me a beer he made that he described as being 100% spontaneously fermented, uh, an American wild ale is what he called it. No way I was going to keep this one to myself. One minute beer review with Jersey and Tim. What about the tenets of national socialism? At least it's an ethos. Here we are, Jersey. They were nihilists, Walter? <laughs> uh, apricot, I can tell just by looking at it. Just by looking at it? It's cloudy. Apricot, half of bison. Oh. Go ahead, drink it and tell me. Oh, it. Uh -huh. I can tell much by looking at shit anymore. I'm, a I'm on another level above learned man. It's a sour. It's good. Whoa, that's a yeah, smell. Yeah, it'll, it'll bite you. I don't think it's a sour. You don't think so? No, I don't know. It's just sour. I don't think it's supposed to be. No, definitely. Oh, dude. Mm, dude. It's good. Of course you think it's good. You're too learned. Oh, right. Let's go back in time. Two years. <laughs> Tim, what do you think of this beer? Not Coors Light. Yeah, it sucks. It's terrible. No, it's, but it's now, not, you, it's terrible. now you just, you've learned to think that everything is good because then that makes you smarter. And oh, wow. this is terrible. Mm. I don't know. It's all right. <laughs> it's got a lot of shit going on. I hate beers with a lot of shit going on. Like almost barley wine-ish. Oh, you're off the reservation. You're I am. saying things that you know now. I don't even know. There's no such thing as a sour barley or, or is, is there? there? We just made it up. Dibs. Patent. Maybe it's a, if you make a barley wine and you let it sit too long. I don't know. It has some, it has a little, little the wine, wine taste to it. I don't like it at all. I'm, I'm going to go like seven. Uh, you you want to say what it is? You want to use it said it's a barley wine. I don't think it's that, but somebody took time to make it. I give it three jerseys. Wow. It's just not my thing, bro. I don't think it's like a full sour. I don't know what it is. It's a Either sour barley wine. It's a barley sour. <gasps> anyway. Well, the, this beer definitely was not Coors Light. Uh, and it couldn't have been more different than my weird version of a wild ale. Uh, to me, the aroma was like wet haze sort of sweet uh, and not to kiss Jersey's ass here, but I did pick up a little bit of stone fruit character that could easily have passed as apricot. Uh, the flavor of this beer was intoxicatingly delicious. It was so good. I could have drank pint after pint, which I don't say often on these on these review beers. Not that they're bad, but this one really did just tickle something on my tongue. Uh, absolutely delicious. Matt, do you have any experience with beers like this? You know, I've done a couple spontaneous fermentation experiments and like trying to get things from or trying to collect yeast from different things. And, you know, like I, I mostly like have done that in ciders, like, uh, you know, naturally fermented cider. And that's that's a little different. Um, but this one sounds fantastic. And it's it's really cool to hear like like just like how much uh, Jersey and Tim have grown. Like I loved the I loved the backwards in time kind of thing. Uh, this isn't course light, uh, but I love that. But yeah, I've I've have really limited experience with it, but it's really awesome. Like I think it's a really cool way to just like get your own like thumbprint into the whole brewing yeah. process. It's a really cool way to do it. Like the experimentation of it, I love. So this one sounds fantastic. I've heard seen some really good ones. Um, yeah. So way to go, way to go, man. Like this sounds like a great. Beer. It was a fantastic beer. Uh, made me think of the neat stuff that they're. The folks over at Bootleg Biology are up to where they're. Oh yeah, yeah, and and uh, man, if if Ian, if you're listening, I, I would strongly recommend uh, that you maybe you know take some of whatever your yeast 
cake, you know, bacteria blend, whatever it was, and uh, maybe send some off to the folks at Bootleg. I think they've got a, a like a homebrew thing going on uh, like that. Thank you so much for sending that delicious beer in. If you'd like to have your beer or any other fermented beverage reviewed by Jersey and Tim, email me, Marshall at brewlosophy.com, and we'll get you all set up. All right, we'll be back right after this break. So I've been hanging out with brewers and craft beer nerds for a long time now, and while we do occasionally have our differences, one thing it seems we all share is a love of learning and trying new things, as well as saving a couple of bucks. Well, right now, Craft Beer and Brewing is helping fans of Brewlosophy learn more while saving some coin by offering 20% off the price of a subscription to their awesome magazine. Chock full of brewing insights, tips, and recipes from industry experts, Craft Beer and Brewing is seriously great. I read every issue page to page myself. To get 20% off your subscription. All you have to do is sign up at beerandbrewing.com slash brewlosophy. Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the super fast counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator comes the hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Accelerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. When dumping wort-soaked grain and leftover low-gravity wort while cleaning up after a brew day, do you ever wonder what your true efficiency would be if that wort made its way to the kettle instead? Using the brew bag, a fabric filter for all mash tuns and brewing methods, allows you to capture every last drop of wort. Not only does this increase kettle efficiency, it lowers your grain bill, which saves you money. Throwing wort in the trash is like dumping a 12-pack down the drain and just doesn't make sense. Use the brew bag and leave no wort behind. I've been using these filters for a long time and recommend them to everyone. I never have to worry about a stuck sparge and clean up is fast and easy. Go grab yourself a brew bag fabric filter at brewinabag.com and be sure to use code TBP17 at checkout to get a discount on your order. Just as the Grainfather all-in-one brewing system revolutionized all grain brewing at home, the Grainfather conical fermenter and glycol chiller take this one step further by giving home brewers state-of-the-art temperature-controlled fermentation just like commercial breweries use. With a full array of features including insulated double-walled construction, an innovative dual-valve yeast dump and sampling tap, and an integrated heating element and temperature controller, the conical fermenter provides a perfect professional quality fermenting environment for superior temperature control. With the ability to individually power and control the temperature of up to four Grainfather conical fermenters, each with their own fermenting schedule, the Grainfather glycol chiller is the perfect addition to ensure superior fermenting results. And for a limited time, you can save 10% on your order by going to Grainfather.com and entering coupon code NZB during checkout. Once again, enter coupon code NZB when you order the Grainfather conical fermenter or glycol chiller at grainfather.com once again that's grainfather.com Benjamin Franklin is the man behind many a great quotes. Perhaps you've heard, beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. Well, old Benji is also credited with saying, when the well is dry, we know the worth of water, which I'm compelled to believe is a more subtle indication of his love of beer. <laughs> <laughs> that that very well could be, though it may, it seems more like an analogy of some kind, like he's trying to make a comparison. But <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't think like he was being terribly <laughs> literal with the, with the water <laughs> quote. The, uh, but anyways, I mean, in terms of like, I love like, so thinking about water and beer, right? And like the, the way in which water plays, it, it, it is a central role, right? Uh, and like to, to bring your, uh, to bring that quote back into it, like without water, there is no beer. Right. There is no way for us to do this. So water is a huge fundamental part of uh, just a beer's composition. And it does far more than just like provide the vehicle for everything else, right? It's not necessarily just um, the thing in which we ultimately get sugar and put hops in and blah, 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 it right. becomes beer. Uh, it, it plays its own central role to that process. And we've known this for a really 
really long time. Like this water and beer have always had like a really tight relationship. Um, <laughs> I mean, what, like you said, without water, there is no beer. It is the absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm talking more about like the chemistry of sure, water, sure. right? Cause like in a lot of instances, like we didn't even know yeast existed for a real long time. Um, and you know, we've, we've dip, like hops even are relatively newish yeah. to, to beer. Like we, we've had grew it and like other, uh, other like, things that don't use hops for the bittering components. Um, but brewers like professional brewers have been using different water sources and making beers that fit the water source for a really long time. And that's a really interesting thing that we see in brewing history is that we like a lot of styles that emerged were they were brewing beers around what they had available to them. And the water was a huge component of that. Mm -hmm. Of What kind of water did they have a really hard water, um, you know, really, really like on the surface, what really soft water um and those things drove how these beers evolved yeah. and how these styles evolved oh, and one part. of the one of the uh things that i've heard too is that and, and I, this makes sense is that the you know the styles that that came from places that have known um hard or soft water i'm thinking of czech pilsner i'm thinking of uh dry stout stuff like that uh burton on trent for for the whole hoppy thing yep, over in England, water. that very hard water uh that it, it's not necessarily necessarily that these brewers are, are, are thinking man you know this water would work great with this style that i'm going to invent uh, it was really yeah. more a function of, wow, these beers just happen to turn out or this type of beer that I'm making happens to turn out uh, uh, really well using the water that we've got available to us. And we've been able to, yep. in, in you know modern days, uh, develop this understanding that, OK, when you have certain amounts of uh, you know certain minerals and, and whatnot, uh, they, it does seem to accentuate certain flavors and, and experiences essentially in the mouth. Uh, and, and what we're talking about today, reverse osmosis, specifically water, uh, that allows us, that is one method for basically getting us to a, a starting point, right? Where we can kind of pa start painting on top of that water to make it more fit what it is we're looking for. Yes, that's exactly it. I mean, thinking about the way, like I'll use Edinburgh as an example, uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, where, uh, like, you know, they, they took water from different sources for different beers. Like they, they understood that, Hey, this water, uh, is working better for this beer and this water from this other source is working for this beer, right? That they, they would do that. And that's ultimately kind of similar to what we're trying to do with reverse osmosis is we're trying to effectively pick out the water that's going to work best yeah. And the way for us to do that, uh, like at a reasonable scale, because we're all, you know, most, I'll say most, most of us are part of a municipal system where water is delivered to us yeah. like pretty effortlessly. We don't really have to do much beyond like pay a bill, which is astounding. Um, <laughs> and we, I don't think that's something we appreciate quite enough. Uh, but we, you know, that also means we don't necessarily get the variability in what water we're accessing. Like some, I, you know, I know some brewers who like really are interested in like, oh, I went to this stream and I got this and I boiled yeah. this water and it's you know, like, it's a fun thing. It's really cool. But if we really want to fine tune our water, we need some way to start from scratch, right? basically, and yeah. build it up. And that's what RO Water enables us to do. Yeah. It's, it's, it's taking the water we have uh, or buying it and coming in with a blank slate and allowing us to really either match a profile or match a mineral profile or a regional profile to a beer uh, and fine tune it for those reasons. Yeah. Or ultimately, um, you know, just just try something new, yeah. like do, do something crazy as opposed to using only your municipal water and trying to say, OK, well, I can only be brewing stouts, really, because that's the kind of water I have. <laughs> yeah, I know people who do that. Uh, speaking. It's absolutely. Yeah, it makes sense. Speaking of uh, municipal water, uh, there are let's before before we get into specifically what reverse osmosis is and, and how it helps us in brewing beer, uh, the, the water that we get at our house, you've got well water. Some folks have wells uh, though that kind of speaks for itself. Yep. Uh, and well water is typically tap into my understanding is uh, groundwater right and these are you're, you're drilling all the way down deep to hit some aquifer uh, yes. and, and so that's one source what is the typical what you know do we know what uh, does groundwater chemistry t tend to change is it uh, you know or, or or does it tend to be more soft my understanding is that surface water tends to have um, uh, can ha tend to have more of a mineral content higher mineral content Absolutely. So like as you do, I mean, especially things like iron, right? Like trace amounts of iron are really common in well water um, and thinking about or, you know, trace amounts of iron are everywhere, but trace amount like larger uh, amounts of iron are really, uh, really heavy in well water. And as like that, and obviously that profile, of course, changes over time. Um, and that's something that happens just as that water, uh, the water layer is shifting. Uh, and like as that goes through and 
you know, that's not to say that municipal water is so much better that you're getting, you know, like when you get water delivered to your house, uh, a lot of municipalities will actually change their source water throughout the year. Yeah, they uh, do. They, you know, they, like they, they will actually shift it. Yeah, they do. And um, in fact, I've been told I've I've talked to a few people. I've talked to a lot of people around the around the U.S. at least who are, you know, they'll, they'll email me asking about water chemistry and whatnot. And sure. they'll they'll when they reach out to their uh, you, you know municipal water district, what they'll get back is oh we can't really tell you what we'll, what we'll do is we'll give you an average, but <laughs> your you know your house is getting water from six different plants, uh, and 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 it can be throughout a single day like like water is coming yeah. in and each one of those is pulling from different sources. It might be surface, it might be groundwater, uh, which to me uh, is one you you know if you're gonna <laughs> I have a guy a friend who works for the water or used to work for the water district around here and he said uh, if you want consistency brew at the same exact time on the same exact day you know collect your water at the same exact time because you're most likely to get the most similar water uh, i was asking him about sending in a sample for testing and he said well yeah you can you can send in a sample but uh, if you're getting water from multiple sources, which thankfully at my house, we've got one source now, um, but even that changes throughout the day, right? With use and whatnot. Um, but it is interesting. Uh, now, one thing that we have to consider when we're when we're using our tap water at our house is the way that the 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 municipal district chooses to sterilize that water. Absolutely. And so, like, I mean, in so the the most common, right? Like, you are going to get uh, chlorine. Is is you is the thing yeah, we see a pool. lot of, yeah. um, you know, and that is something that we can remove from water. It leads to off flavors. Uh, it's you know, chlorine especially like can lead to uh, some phenolic off characters, um, and you know, chlorophenols ultimately are expressed in that beer as like a band aid ish flavor, yeah. um, you know, or, or like a burnt plastic or medicinal. Um, we can remove that just by like a metabisulfite addition, uh, like a Campton tablet. Uh, that's something that you know can interact or boiling it. Boiling is an effective uh, chlorine removal tactic, but obviously that takes some time if you don't really want to do that. Um, but in addition to chlorine, like you, you raise an excellent point that municipal water contains things other than just uh, other other than just like the major ions that we think about in terms of brewing water, yeah. or the ones that we typically tend to think about, right? Um, and that is. It is a huge consideration because like, especially when we get into things like uh, nitrate, you know, um, nitrate is a, is a trace mineral in a lot of water and it can be toxic to yeast in higher concentrations. The same for iron. Um, iron can really lead to metallic off flavors. Uh, it can actually promote foam stability, which is really interesting. Like huh. iron does play a small role in that, but it, it mostly like we tend to think of like really wanting to reduce the iron, especially because like the metallic off flavor and the, the uh, possible for, like detrimental effects for like oxidation. Yeah. Uh, you know, fluoride. Yeah, that's a big one. Like fluoride, <laughs> like a lot of places add fluoride to their water. Um, that one, you know, I, I've been doing quite a bit of reading for fluoride and it doesn't seem like there is too much of a problem in the brewing water at the concentrations we typically see from our water supplies. But that said, uh, it, it's definitely not something we think about adding, especially when you go from an <laughs> RO profile, you don't really go and like add fluoride. Yeah, to your thing. yeah. So in, in all these trace minerals uh, are trace, like they're very small amounts, but there's theoretically like that's one of the considerations when we do blank slate brewing like from a water from an ro profile is even though we're adding back those major ions and those major minerals um those trace minerals are still missing and, and does that play a role and that's something i think that we've yet to kind of test and it's something i think is really interesting to think about yeah yeah i'm the whole trace mineral conversations that we've been having are I, i'm fascinated by uh something that i, I heard uh I, I this is i forget it might have been drew beecham uh we, we were chatting about water a while back and um there's there's some good evidence that chlorine, you know, uh, is very unstable. So you can actually, if you, one of the reasons I started collecting water the night before, uh, you know, my my district does use just small amounts of chlorine. Thankfully, it doesn't. Sure. Sm my my water doesn't smell like a swimming pool when I when I pour it out of the tap. But um, you can leave chlor, you know, five whatever eight gallons of, of chlorine in your kettle uncovered overnight, uh, and the chlorine's going to volatilize off. You know, you, you're mm. essentially now chloramines. Th that's way more stable. That's where you want to use Campton or, or potassium metabisulfite, sodium metabisulfite works as well. And it is, you just use a little bit and it is an immediate reaction that happens and you can use that water without, you know, risking making a, a medicine bomb. So I uh, just wanted to make sure people understand that the other way to remove certain things
things that we don't want. I'm not sure how well it works on fluoride, <laughs> but is to uh, carbon filter uh, or, or use any form of filter, which gets us into reverse osmosis as well. Uh, there's also like UV sterilization. You've seen these uh, UV wands that people drop into like river water and then they can mm-hmm. make it safe to drink. I'm not sure if, if people are using that on the on the brewing or I have not seen that used on the home brew side. I, I would imagine. I think it's more for uh, contaminants uh, in, yeah. in water, but yeah. still uh, it's not going to remove anything. Filtration, Correct. on the other hand, uh, you know, there's carbon block filter. That's what I use. I, I run all of my water through an RV filter. Now, the thing about that is it's not it's not changing the TDS or the total dissolved solids, uh, the ionic makeup of the water in any way whatsoever. It, it no, is, it's just removing the chlorine and chloramine. Um, and, and that's it's going to do that just by using like an active carbon. And that's, that's something it. like car, carbon do, is a, is an incredible natural filter. Yeah. Um, and we see that a lot when we talk about like barrel char, like uh, and, and how that acts as a filter to a degree. Uh-huh. Um activated carbon is a fantastic so it'll it will remove uh you know some water contaminants um like some organic compounds that are in the water uh and anything that comes along with those but yeah to your point like it's not going to really impact the major minerals uh that we see in brewing and that's i mean just like really off the top of my head that's uh like you know calcium sulfate magnesium which is kind of trace um sodium uh uh, chloride so yeah Chlor- thank you chloride <laughs> so all all of those major ion components um, it's not going to really impact those as much but chlorine and chloramine removal definitely uh, it is going to take care of so, so that's something that is really positive yeah well but here now here's the thing uh, if you go out and you buy yourself a $35 carbon filter uh, and, and you run your water through it at you know you know, two gallons a minute type of thing. And sure, you're yeah. not, you're not going to in order. And this is another thing that I've fairly recently learned. You can remove chlorine. Uh, I forget what the exact numbers are, but you, you, to remove chlorine using a carbon filter, I believe you have to collect something like half a gallon, uh, you know, per minute, like you're running it really slow to remove. Oh yeah, absolutely. Now to remove chloramines, my understanding is you're basically collecting water uh, at a trickle coming out. You, it really has to be in contact with that filter, not get pushed too, through too fast. Uh, with if you know that your water it uses chloramines, just just go and you want to use your tap water, just go buy some Campton tablets. <laughs> That's the easiest yeah, way to get definitely. rid of that. Now definitely. reverse osmosis takes filtration a pretty major step further. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, so for reverse osmosis. It's not just an activated, uh, an activated carbon filter. It's it's a semi, it's a it's a reverse osmosis membrane. It's it's a semi permeable membrane that effectively will remove all, like only you know, like a high nineties percentile, somewhere around ninety five to ninety nine percent, is going to be of the total dissolved solids are going to be removed from that water. So ultimately, and I mean, in addition to the chlorine and chloramine, right? Like that's also going to do it. Uh, now that said, like. Uh, reverse osmosis water also gathered kind of at a trickle at a really small oh, it's amount. so slow um, yeah it is it's incredibly slow it's something that is a consideration if you are going to use a reverse osmosis filter um, definitely consider like just the amount of time that's going to take like gather your water way beforehand uh, don't try to do it the day of. you if can't you do like it's just it's it's just not it'd be an unreasonable brew day. so I um, I went out um, <laughs> I, I mentioned earlier that I uh, picked up a reverse osmosis filter I I'll, I'll see if I can't remember to put a link to the one that I bought in the uh, in the this, uh, the, the show notes for this uh, episode now. Yeah. Um, the, but the one I bought, it was about, I think all together with all the parts about 80 bucks. And, um, and it, you know, it does, it has, it's three stage filter. I think the first one is carbon. Uh, and then, and then there's two other stages, which we can talk about here in a minute. I'm, I'm, I'm still not entirely sure how RO filters work myself. Uh, but you, you have to push, you know, uh, your water through at a fairly high pressure. And so, you, you know, you're cranking yep. on your water and it comes out, no joke, I was getting a gallon, or I was, what was it? I was getting a gallon every, uh, about two and a half hours, I think is what it was. So in Absolutely, or- well, when you get that reject stream, right? Oh, like and effectively, yeah. when you get uh, the... That's another consideration for RO water, water uh, because that higher concentrations of the total dissolved solid has to go somewhere. Yeah, um, it, it has to leave, and we call that's the wastewater. That is the um, and it is a lot of water. Oh yeah, it is a lot of water compared to what you ultimately get from an RO filter. Yeah, so that's the, yeah. When you're using an RO filter, for those of you who are considering getting one, um, there's you have two uh, basically hoses. There's there's small tubes is what they are mm-hmm. uh, that come off. There's a red one and a blue one. Typically, the blue one is is your RO water. Water, super pure. I, t- I now remember. I, I think I was at 386 TDS total dissolved solids with the crappy water I was getting. After filtration, I was down to two, two TDS. I mean, there was this was no yeah. no joke, clean pure water. The uh, the errant stream, the that that red 
basically trash water was uh, it was flowing out probably ten times faster than than the water collection, the RO water collection. Absolutely, and that primarily, I mean, not only is that a vehicle for the, uh, not only is that a vehicle for like the the higher concentrations of what's getting removed, but it's also due to the fact that, like you kind of mentioned, you do need to do, uh, you need to do this at a pretty high pressure. You need to do this enough to kind of really overcome the osmotic pressure that is, which is you know the pressure generated by the uh, the presence of total dissolved solids in the water, right? Uh, so as just you need to overcome that pressure in order for the water to pass through that membrane. And, and then ultimately catching all of those waste products. Um, so it, it needs to be at that high pressure, which means you need to have a pretty high pressure blow off because it's not going to collect. It's not going to pass through the membrane fast enough to actually like offset that pressure. So, so you need the wastewater to be at a higher pressure in order to actually like it doesn't explode. Yeah. So what exactly is the this membrane and how how does an RO filter necessarily work? Like what is it doing to the water? Oh yeah, so an RO membrane is um, effectively a series of filters, right? It is it is a so the way an RO uh, an RO membrane works is there's a lot of ways that you can remove. Uh, you know, total dissolved solids from water. And we've talked a little bit about that. Like you can, there are reactions, there's boiling. Um, there's a lot of things that can interplay there, but an a RO filter is actually exactly what it sounds like in terms of being a filter. Um, it is, it is using filtration, which is to say it is a smaller and smaller and smaller series of layers that only allow certain size of items to pass through. Sure. It. So sure. it's a filter in that capacity, but the membrane itself is a series, right? So there is, uh, and similar to the ways in which we talk about like filtering beer, you have this first larger filter, which is to say like, so it's, it's going to allow larger items to pass through it. Uh, and that is going to be like a lot of sediment, like dirt, uh, like actual sediment characteristics. So larger things that you can see, uh, there's gonna, there is also a carbon filter. So like we said before, like it's going to use an active carbon in order to, it's both naturally a great filter, but also is going to help remove chlorine and chloramine. Uh, the RO, filter contains one of those as well um then it has the the actual like ro membrane which is going to be a series of layers that are getting smaller and only allowing certain things to pass through it um and then ultimately a lot of them will have what you know colloquially is called a polish filter but the polish filter um will just remove any other like remaining taste or water ones it's really the one that is like the finest and it's going to ultimately like, get things really through yeah um now that said because in this i mean we're just for like we're talking like 0.001 microns yeah like when you tiny you know, like tiny, we are talking, tiny yeah exactly we're talking so small uh but because of that semi-permeability right because it gets smaller and smaller and because it is so small that's also why we have to do this it's such a high pressure because the amount of osmotic pressure generated by the total dissolved solids and then the pressure the pressure just from the force of uh, what's going into the osmosis filter needs to ultimately be strong enough to also force through things through that sediment filter yeah, which is right. getting again incredibly smaller um now that is also why you do need to change like reverse osmosis i don't know a lot of the ones on the market but it looks like most of them that are uh within you know fairly reasonable price like around a hundred dollars or so usually good for like 50 to 100 gallons of, of reverse osmosis water which as you've pointed out is about like a thousand gallons or so of wastewater um depending, depending <laughs> if not on more the i mean you, yeah, yeah you're tossing exactly. most of the water that you're pushing through this thing Exactly. It really depends on it, but it needs to offset that pressure. Um, but that said, so it's it's so it's like about 50 to 100 gallons of uh, RO water that come out of it. And that's why it needs to be changed so much, because yeah. those really fine filters like they get clogged pretty quick, relatively speaking. Right. Um, I, it seems like not a lot, but you for a lot of these, you can replace these filters uh, for cheaper than actually buying the system. Oh, so absolutely. it's really not a problem. Um, it ends up being pretty okay uh, price wise typically, yeah. but the that's effectively how the RO filter works. Like it has a series of filters where it's getting rid of the dirt, it's doing some carbon filtration. Um, it is then obviously getting smaller and smaller and is actually filtration. It's actually like a degree of sediment removal, yeah. right? It's just doing it under pressure. Well, so, so now people might be listening going, geez, Manita. I don't want to have to wait, you know, three days to collect eight gallons of water. I don't want to <laughs> sure. have to go buy filters. You could also just run to your local grocery store and and buy reverse osmosis water. Um, yep. it's, That's what I do. It's really cheap. Yeah, it's not it's not expensive at all. What do you, what what do you pay, Matt, when you go and buy RO water? 
I pay, I think, 90, it's like 87 cents or 90 cents a, uh, a gallon, yeah, so, right? Or some, something along those lines. It's really it's really inexpensive. Um, I think I can get it even cheaper for some places. Like, I know they'll have, like, big stand-up machines where you can fill, a, like, a five-gallon container. Yeah. Um, and then I think it's, like, maybe 24 cents to 47 cents a gallon. Right, right. Um, it's, it's much, much cheaper. So, it is, it's a kind of a hassle. Um, there's definitely, like, an advantage to having the RO thing at home. But that presents its own series of hassles that you have to deal with. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but uh, it's, it's its own thing, but it's really not a big deal, um, and it's it's super cheap. Well, and and for you know people out there are constantly you know they make they make a batch of, of homebrewed beer, and they're sitting there going, "This just there's something about this that just isn't where I want it to be." It's chlorine. It's <laughs> I would say it's usually a sanitation issue. I'm that old school, <laughs> but 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 seriously, water is one of those things. When you start mucking around with your water, is in my experience, and you hear this from a lot of people. It, that is when it took their homebrew from from homebrew to tasting like a commercial beer. You start adjusting certain mineral levels, and I don't think there's a professional brewer out there uh, who's worth their weight, at least who uh, who would who would say that you should just ignore your water. You need to pay attention to your water, and I think RO is a good way for those who have you know folks who have either harder water or or just not good water at their house. RO is probably the best, in my opinion, the best way yeah. to just create this blank slate, build up what you want, and you can experiment with with different levels of you know ion levels and whatnot uh and it's and it's a lot easier that the biggest hassle is just getting your ro now again you can buy yeah. a filter you can go to the store and buy some one of the things that i was told i'm curious if you've heard anything about this uh when i got my io when i got my ro filter uh i was i was talking to john palmer and asked him a question he goes yeah you probably don't want to collect your RO water in a stainless kettle. Because, you know, that's if, if I go out early the day before and I collect my water, I put it right in the kettle that I'm going to be using yeah. to warm it up. Uh, it, apparently, I don't understand the reasoning behind this, but apparently uh, RO water is so pure that it can actually like etch stainless, something like that. Not etch it, but uh, some in some way have an impact on it. I honestly, like, I've, I've heard that before. I've never experienced anything with it. Like, I've never noticed anything happen to my kettles, yeah. but I don't want to say that it can't happen. Yeah, I think that's a very technical, uh, you know, you, you know, it, technically, this this is probably not a good idea. I think you're going to have a lot of homebrewers going, wait a minute, uh, I've been collecting my RO water in my stainless kettles, and I'm still alive. Yeah, the the right, kettle yeah, still right, works. Right. So, uh, but but on its own, you know, I, well, in my experience, you can taste RO water. It's delicious to me. It is it is good water. I mean, I, I, as far as good water goes, RO water tastes really good, fresh out of the you know the the, the blue hose. Fantastic, uh, but it is so pure. There's so little to it that uh, some would contend that it's just may not be that great for making beer with on its own. Matt, you were curious to see how a beer made with straight RO water water would taste and you put it to the test we're going to get to those results right after these messages after a long brew day the last thing i want to do is waste more time chilling wort i've tried so many different options and ultimately i settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by jaded brewing with the king cobra and hydra i'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com and be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supplies, the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code Brewpod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. 
Hi, I'm Stephen Leach, creator of Brow Supply Brewing Systems, here to tell you about our latest Unibrow Brewing System. Modeled after the brew in a bag method, the Unibrow uses the same kettle for both mashing and boiling, replacing the fabric bag with a stainless basket that can hold up to 20 pounds of grain. A heating element is run by an electric controller that allows for the maintenance of specific mash temperatures and makes mashing easier than ever. Each Unibrow is shipped with a counterflow chiller and the parts required to brew a batch of beer. We're really proud of the Unibrow and we know you'll love it as much as we do. Go check it out at BrowSupply.com and sign up for our email list to receive special deals in your inbox. I reckon most brewers view RO water as a blank slate. That's certainly how I look at it. Uh, A starting point to build one's desired profile. That's not exactly what you did, though, in a recent experiment, Matt. No. So, I mean, you know, we talk about water a lot. And after going through some of the other water chemistry experiments, like, you know, mineral load and uh, like just, you know, different different levels, um, I was really blown away. It's like, man, that's like some of the like these are turning out typically significant. um, And that's I think the mineral load one wasn't. But I was really curious, like, okay, well, what if I what if I just don't use anything? Yeah. What if I use straight RO water? Because in theory, uh, like, you know, if we were to like be technical about that, like without calcium, I shouldn't have as good enzymatic activity in the mash. Uh, the yeast should be a little hurt because not only does it not have calcium as a yeast nutrient, but it doesn't have any zinc. It doesn't have any copper. There's no, like, there's a lot of things that act as yeast nutrients or like magnesium is going to be contributed from the grain. So that right. gets added. The grain itself is going to add a profile to this. Um, just, you know, in regards to it's going to contribute uh, like potassium. It's going to contribute magnesium. Blah, right, blah, blah. right, right, right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in theory, this really shouldn't this should have gone really poorly, both from an <laughs> enzymatic action. It also should be really flat. Yeah. From a as theoretical a right? perspective, a, a, a beer made with straight RO water isn't going to pop. It's not going to have, you know, beery character that we expect. You know, exactly. Right, yeah. And, you know, we have historically soft water profiles all over the place. Like, uh, the you know, I talk a lot about Tricare House Brewery in Scotland. They do. They have a really soft profile. The most famous is going to be Czech Pills. Like they have a like historically incredibly soft profile, like less than 20 ppm calcium yeah um which is you know we typically try to think oh 50 ppm is the minimum for calcium yeah but, you know yeah. We, we i think that's been shifting recently in like homebrew thought um but yeah this this should like this profile where i do ro zero the beer shouldn't pop the beer shouldn't it doesn't have any salt it doesn't have any chloride it doesn't have any sulfate and so all these like flavor ions that are non-existent like the beer could maybe just be brown it should be muddy um <laughs> gray even though, like, right even, gray even these soft exactly gray like these soft <laughs> profiles still have a lot of these minerals in them yeah um we you know in a lot i say a lot like not relatively like relatively very low to other brewing profiles and brewing water but to ro water quite a bit yeah, of, TD, yeah. of total it's dissolved true. solids so i For that exact reason, went with a Czech Pilsner for this batch because in theory, like the soft water is typical. Yeah. Um, And so I ended up picking kind of a medium uh, adjusted profile. So I gathered both my water for these Czech Pilsners um, and it was a full full volume mash, 60 minutes. I mashed at 146 degrees Fahrenheit for each of them, 63C. And one of the batches of water was just total RO. I took a TDS uh, reading and it was, I think it was like three or four. Yeah. Um, it was really small, really low amount. Uh, the adjusted profile was 50 uh, ppm calcium, 5 ppm magnesium, uh, which I added, um, zero ppm sodium, which I've actually like shifted on that recently. Like I'm adding sodium to more batches. Yeah, but thanks Jake, huh? relevant yeah. <laughs> yeah really um and then the uh the sulfite uh the sulfate and the chloride were both at 60 ppm now my, um, my understanding is both of these you started with the same ro water and then and yeah to keep to keep them as similar as possible and then you adjusted using uh gypsum which is calcium sulfate and and uh, uh epsom salt it's it looks like to get that magnesium calcium up a little chloride. bit yep yep um and some calcium chloride so uh, that's it so now you you've got your adjusted one uh, at those levels that you talked about and you've got your ro straight ro uh this was a, this was such an exciting one for me because it's i just love water chemistry <laughs> so. yes definitely i yeah i entirely agree um and it was a, it was tons of fun to do and i was really excited about it because like in preparation for it i did a lot of research um and again like i highly recommend martin brungard's water knowledge page which i think oh, i've done so before good. on this podcast yeah it's just a it's a great primer if you want to get the door open on water chemistry like everyone thinks of water chemistry as like the next step and it's like kind of intimidating 
Uh, if you just want to open the door, you want to like just learn a little bit more to get yourself like your feet wet. Uh, that page that and Martin's a great guy and yeah. really knowledgeable. So it's a great thing to do. So one of the um, things that I was um, really curious about with this one was the impact that mineralization that that adjusting the water with the minerals that you did would have on pH. Now, my understanding is to keep things even in this one, since we were looking specifically at the minerals, is that you you did adjust each to, to have the same mash pH. I did. So I uh, I used Bruin water uh, coincidentally. Um, and I adjusted them each with lactic with a small amount of lactic acid. It was really uh, tiny, which, you know, ultimately any lactic acid addition is typically yeah. tiny. Um, and I did adjust them to be the same. Uh, I wanted to kind of make sure that the impact of what we were looking at was really just the, the mineral additions yeah. that, um, it, it didn't have to do with any possible differences generated by a difference in pH. That said, I think I may like in the future, if I were to do this again, I think I wouldn't, I don't think I would like do I would call that like a factor of the experiment yeah, uh, yeah. is that, you know what I mean? Like, okay well it is going to be different because uh in theory like without that calcium like it's not going to react in the same enzymatic way so the ph is going to be different um no, I probably I'm, wouldn't not, do it. I'm not entirely convinced that it would have made a difference anyways that, that that's still it's not a theoretical. good excuse that's still not it's a good excuse for not making a you know for not making the lactic acid addition i'm just based on other experiments that we've done but uh yeah interesting absolutely that, and that's and that's totally fair but i so ultimately yes i did adjust them with lactic acid to be the same uh and they ended up really consistent it was uh 5.41 uh for the ro water and then 5.0 uh 5.4 oh so 5.41 versus 5.4 or 5.40 for the adjusted profile yeah. so i mean we're gonna call that identical uh you took yeah, these it's, it's pretty damn close yeah so you, you took the words you boiled them for an hour you added check saws which is amazing hop by the way uh now here's so some interesting stuff uh, when you got done with the boil you chilled the worts and then you took hydrometer measurements uh the ro water was at 1055 og while the adjusted water profile uh beer or wort at, was at 1057 so you know that's only two specific gravity points which may or may not be due to some other factor but I, it makes me yeah. wonder if that you know one of the things that, that people talk about when it comes to adjusting your water is that it's you you can encourage more efficiency it's it's i have a hard time dismissing it because it is kind of in line with what we would expect from a chemistry perspective yeah um that said like it is it is a really small difference um <laughs> it is a difference don't get me wrong but it's it's a very very small one so i have a hard time like attributing that oh for sure this did something right here. right we're you not gonna make I mean? any like, crazy leaps but, here but but also potentially yeah it, it definitely could have led to an impact in the efficiency which is what we would expect yeah yeah totally um and you know like after after doing that adjustment, um, I split a starter of uh, Imperial Yeast L17 Harvest, uh, which is a great yeast, uh, really, really delicious. Yeah, um, fermented for at 48 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 C for about eight days uh, before racking into the kegs and spunding them uh, at 68 degrees Fahrenheit 20 C for a few more days. Um, so that's I do that for a lot of my lagers, which is like do a uh, shorter uh, primary ferment, sometimes even usually shorter than eight days, um, a shorter primary ferment cooler. And then I will after transferring, um, increase the temperature and let fermentation finish out kind of under pressure. Sure, uh, and sure. that's also like carbonation. So once uh, once they were done, they were ultimately done fermenting. Uh, I had a final gravity of 1014 on the RO batch. So uh, pretty, pretty in line with what I expected. And then 1015 on the final gravity. So really, really even though they kind of started with that 0. 0.002 uh, difference, they finished out at a 0. 0.001 difference um, and really, really similar. Yeah, nothing crazy there. So uh, exactly. Again, I would even call that that could be a reading thing or a reading error. That could be that could be anything. Could yeah, be absolutely. Anything. Yep. Um, those beers were placed in the kegerator and the, I let them lager for another week before uh, ultimately serving them to tasters. Uh, and before I did that, like obviously I sample all these beers and look at them myself and do all that. Uh, they both turned out really clear, which was great. They're gorgeous. Um, yep. Just to, and yeah, yeah they, they turned out really well. <laughs> I want one uh, the right picture now. unfortunately doesn't do them justice, um, <laughs> just because they are uh, very. It's it's a it was a bad it was terrible lighting. I should have really like worked <laughs> oh, yeah. on this one. It was really bad. Um, I didn't. I decided to go for my gelatin stuff because uh, they they were already really clear at those final gravity samples, um, and. Ultimately, I I really like both these beers. They looked great. I couldn't tell any differences um, really just by looking at them, right? Like by looking at either, they looked exactly the same. We would expect the calcium beer um, to ultimately be different. Like we, we you know what, I, or the beer that had calcium, yeah. uh, it should help it be clear. It should help clarify it a bit, but they really looked exactly the same to me. Yeah, they, me too. The picture, the, that terrible picture that you're referring to, they, they actually do yeah, look exactly it is the real, same. It is real bad. You, you did a series of five triangle tests uh, on this mm -hmm. one. How did you perform? I was four for five. Uh, so I was, I did pretty well, uh, but you know, like, especially when you know the variable, if you're not 
I always feel a little weird if I don't get it every single time. Like I always like talk about how consistent, like, oh, I can definitely tell. But if you're four for five, you really can't definitely tell. Um, you're, you can like pretty much tell. It's pretty much tell, yeah. Four, yeah, but you, you can pretty much tell. But you're uh, four for five. So uh, I I really perceived the adjusted beer to actually, I did I did in, I did have a fuller flavor. I did think that it tasted more full. Um, I definitely thought the hop character was more expressive in the aroma. Um, and I just kind of perceived the RO beer. We used the term gray earlier, and I like that. Like it was, it was less characteristically clean and uh, defined. Not yeah. sharp, but defined. And... Uh, I, I definitely think that the mineral beer had a better profile. Like I enjoyed it a lot more. It, it was really not a contest. Yeah. Well, and you know, that's, that goes along with what we'd expect. There could be bias playing in. And that's why we serve Absolutely. these triangle tests to blind tasters. You served the beers to 22 participants out of which 12 would have needed to identify the odd beer out in order for us to say that it was significant. And we had 14 people, so two more than we needed, two more than the threshold. 14 people were able to identify the unique sample in the triangle test, which allows us to say that these beers were probably pretty different, perceptibly. Definitely, um, and people were pretty, uh, people were pretty vocal about these beers like being different at the time and you always like kind of get this gut impression when you're doing the experiments that uh oh is this going to be significant or not and we don't really know until we're done but it's it's always like a gut a gut feeling and people <laughs> yeah. were really uh you know, talking about it and people kind of echoed sort of the same thing that they definitely thought like the people who preferred the adjusted water beer, um, you know, reported saying things like that they were, uh, that there is a little fuller, that they thought it was a little cleaner, um, that, you know, that it had better hop aroma. So things really consistent with like some of my impressions. Yeah. Um, but that said, like, uh, when you look at the preference numbers, like seven people did prefer the adjusted water, uh, beer, um, three of them had preferred the RO beer. Um, and thought thought that it was better. Um, and, you know, I don't really know. Spe- I don't remember specifically what those people had mentioned, but it definitely makes me, you know, it, it's always one of those funny things that like taste is not uh, a universal. Of course, um, preference. Certainly they just isn't. definitely yeah. prefer the RO, which is great. It's totally fine. Um, and it definitely also speaks to the fact that even though I did think that the the adjusted water beer was better um, and I thought that it was fuller, you know, the RO water beer wasn't bad. It wasn't a bad beer by any means. Um, it just I thought it was different. Yeah. Um, Three people said that there was a they didn't really have a preference despite noticing a difference, which that's totally normal as well. Common. Uh, yeah. One person noted having no difference, which that happens now and then. I mean, that's definitely something that can happen yeah. where uh, someone's a little unsure and maybe either guessed correctly or they uh, <laughs> they just weren't sure or yeah. you know, like. But that said, when people do say like, oh, well, they were guessing. We don't know to what degree guessing is subconsciously influenced by a perception they have. Totally, totally. Um, you know what I mean? And, like, that's and, a big thing, too. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, I guessed. It's like, you you may have said you guessed, but you might know well, on some level, and, and, right? And one of the one of the critiques people have, and we're, we, we're going to stick to RO water here, but one of the critiques people have with with uh, with statistics and whatnot, or, the, or what we'll get, it's typically from somebody who, and I'm not saying this to, to con- sound condescending, people who don't really understand statistics very well is they'll say, well, if, if somebody said that they didn't taste a difference, why don't you just scrap their data and, and only use it? Because that's what stats does is it, is it, it, it calculates for people just guessing. <laughs> so that's yeah. it, when somebody says they don't, they didn't taste a difference. That's okay. I mean, maybe they didn't. Um, but the, but the, you know, statistic that we're using, uh, uh it, you know, controls for that. So we also just, we don't know that they guessed. Yeah. Like you, you might say you guessed or think you guessed, but we don't, we don't know. We don't yeah. know to what degree. So yeah, like you said, it accounts for that. But yeah, we'll stick to RO water. Totally fair. <laughs> um, and that was my fault. We like got off on a tangent there. The, uh, but so those preference numbers came back and they were kind of in line with what I would expected that a couple people would prefer RO. Uh, most people preferring the adjusted, which is what I preferred. Yeah. Um, and it, it's just strange to me how similar these beers really were like we they came back significant but they looked really similar um and i expected that to be really different the the there was definitely like a possible impact to efficiency but it wasn't as severe as i had kind of anticipated it sure, being sure, yeah. um and it just makes me wonder like how much the grain and what we do really does contribute to the beer that kind of enables its own conversion and enzymatic action um 
in how that goes. Yeah. So I'm, you know, this one was a really fun one to do, uh, and it it really surprised me on a lot of levels. Even I, I expected it to come back significant, just my own bias and dogma, um, and my own experience like messing with water chemistry. But it it really was not as severe a difference as I thought it sure, would. Sure, p- things could be different, uh, noticeably perceptibly different, but still very very similar. It sounds like to me, Absolutely. that was the case here. Um, you know, I, it I before you did this experiment, I would never have recommended anyone. I don't I don't make very many recommendations anyways, but I would never have recommended somebody just go use straight RO water without adjusting it. It seems to me, first off, sounds like you're not going to be using straight RO water, you know, anytime soon. Adjusting water is easy enough. Uh, Beersmith, the three has a great water tab. You can use Bruin water. Uh, There's all kinds of of calculators out there to help you make the proper adjustments. Uh, The way I sort of think about, uh, you know, using RO water in particular, because it's so blank, is that, you know, you can, you can make a steak, throw a steak on the grill, not season it, and it's still going to taste good. Steak is good. But if you add some salt, some pepper, some other seasonings, you're going to make that steak taste just a little bit better. And that is sort of how I view uh, uh, water adjustment and whatnot, is that you're adding seasoning to make it uh, uh, just a little bit more better than it would have been without it. <laughs> and that's, so yeah, that's my so analogy. Uh, we do have some reader comments I want to get to, some really good ones, actually. Awesome. Uh, the first one here comes from Lupulus. I believe we know who that is, Matt. Um, yeah, I know I know Loop. Uh, that is, so that, uh, I, you know what, I actually don't know if he's comfortable with me doxing him, um, but uh, I, don't, I actually don't know him well <laughs> enough to know that, but I do know him, uh, and he's a really nice guy. Uh, he makes a damn good Kolsch. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. So Lupulus says, uh, it would have been nice... Uh, it would have been nice to have the mineral analysis of the beers to know what the differences were. You will get mm. minerals from the malt, so it's not a comparison of nothing versus something. It's interesting mm. to see that in your experiment, relatively minor amounts uh, had a significant effect. Also, kudos for the beer uh, to pick up that small difference. You must have brewed a great beer. Oh, he's being so nice. And your process was certainly tight. This is a really good point. Um, you know, Absolutely. very rarely do we consider getting a mineral analysis of our finished beer uh, like you discussed earlier, you are you are imparting some you know uh, c- certain minerals just by brewing the beer itself from the malt. I 100 percent agree. Like it would have been super cool to do. Uh, like to another thing I should have done is I should have done another TDS reading of. Um the the adjusted profile and then the finished beers um i think that would have been a cool thing to do that i could do and then if we had access to the lab like it'd be great to get some readings of both these beers because it makes me think of some of the uh the recent water uh things that have been discussed recently in some homebrewing forums where they did like some water profile work of uh, a finished beer um and like all these differences and like the the water profile of a finished beer looks radically different yeah. than the input profile it really of does. a finished I, beer I, right I, I think you're referring to if we saw the same thing somebody is basically going through and taking popular hazy IPA and yeah, and having them exactly sending it. sending the sending the beers the finished beers into Ward Labs right and and having it analyzed really interesting i my issue with that just to get that out there is when you're and, and i think Lupulus here is kind of hitting on it i i don't i don't think he's he's wrong about you know, wanting to know what what the mineral differences would be, just because that's it's interesting. But if you're <laughs> if somebody's saying, "Hey, I took you know the uh, mineral composition, I got the mineral composition of say the alchemist heady topper or something," uh, so now you can go and adjust your water to make it look like that. Uh, no, <laughs> that's not how that yeah, works. Exactly, it, that's exactly it. Yeah, and, yeah, and Loop has a great point uh, on this uh, can i call you loop uh yeah no loop ha- loop has a great uh point on this one um and i i entirely agree with him so like if we would ever to do this one again i think that would be a great way to like really make the experiment more robust yeah um, it'd be really interesting like do that so that'd be that's a great comment and i agree entirely I think yeah it's a great point hindsight certainly is 2020 uh, I, i'd be interested to see that as well next comment comes from jack he says what i'm dying to know is can you achieve the same with post additions. I think what he's referring to is cold side, mm. you know, post fermentation yeah. additions. If you made the additions after fermentation of the clean batch, would anyone tell the difference? Would the beers become identical? Does the profile affect the mash much or is it just the flavor of the water? Or do certain minerals bring out certain flavors? It's important because if I can make additions post, then I can trial a range of different profiles on a single batch and really dial things in. Jack, you're in luck. We've done that experiment already. Yep. Uh, we will do a show on that one. And yes, you can absolutely make mineral additions to finished beer and uh and in our experiments and in my experience it does seem to have an impact is that anything you've messed around with matt 
Yeah, I've I've done some post fermentation mineral adjustments, and I do a lot of like post fermentation blendings of the ciders and stuff, um, and like doing that. So you you absolutely can. Um, I will say like from a theoretical standpoint, like it you know water minerals do very much so impact the mash. Um, like just like that's what we would expect to happen. Um, expect to believe and uh, that so you know you you'd miss out on that aspect of it but some of these flavor ions certainly like you can definitely give that a shot um and do it post yeah but that's so yeah it can, it can be done yeah why, why not you can absolutely there was one of the one of the um recommendations i wish i could give credit to who told me this but um you know when i when i've messed around with uh you know taking sample glasses of beer and and tweaking the uh, you know i'll add like a one little nugget of calcium chloride i'll just do a little sprinkle of gypsum uh one of the better ideas that somebody gave me was to make basically uh, solutions of uh, like watery solutions of gypsum and calcium chloride and all of the other types of, uh, of stuff that you would add to your water. And then you mm. can dose uh, with the liquid. You can dose your beer with drops of the liquid and kind of get an idea of the impact that those have. So yeah, uh, it, I will say it's definitely uh, like in the, in a post edition, um, usually don't add dry things to your beer. You, usually you do want to dissolve it, especially in a post edition, um, just because then you do get like it's it dissolves more easily. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because yeah. that stuff can just kind of fall to the bottom of the glass. It, yeah, it can, it can just do it and it will yeah. eventually dissolve like it's going to. But yeah, if you it just to be smart about it. Yeah. Do yeah. that. <laughs> All right. Reddit user. Oh, boy. Dick's fish, uh, I guess is his name. Uh, this only helps to confirm that my beer was better after I started caring about water. It also feels good when someone or it also feels good when something I really took the time to change makes a noticeable difference. Oh, amen. Definitely, man. Absolutely. Yeah, I entirely agree. Like, it, it, of course, of course, it feels good like that when you do something like that, that it changes. Um, I would be a little and I think that's actually speaks to like why we are so nervous about the way in which bias impacts our perception of changes we make yep. is, is the fact that, yeah, it does feel good. It, it feels great to know that the nine hours you spent doing a triple decoction <laughs> are making a difference in your beard. But, awesome. but is it making a difference? Um, that's there's there lies the question <laughs> exactly so there you go but like and so uh, t- i entirely agree um i also i share the same opinion i think my beer is better now that i'm paying attention to water um at the very least i believe it's more consistent uh, yeah, yeah because like while it does for sure uh my water profile like in my municipality does change throughout the year and you can you know you can use a total dissolved solid meter to try to guesstimate which profile you're at you know like if you have four profiles and you've sent them all into ward labs and you know the tds of each one is like oh it's roughly 300 for this profile it's roughly 400 for this profile you can use a tds meter and maybe try to guesstimate but ultimately using ro water has been a nice way for me to know every single time that i'm within a pretty much equal range for different beers and different profiles absolutely that's that's the thing that's really high on my list for uh for doing it but i'm yeah i'm with you man i thought it's good uh yeah likewise uh reddit user chuck norris 10101 uh left a comment i feel like if a simple change was made to how a local homebrew shops marketed kits and beer brewing process water modification would move from one of the last steps to one of the first and i think people would stick with the hobby probably more frequently. Ooh, that's big claim there. It's the single biggest factor apart from fermentation temperature on beer end results. Uh, local homebrew shops should be able to get local water averages, which is all that is needed to get close anyway, and then include measured amounts to have people buy a small bulk amount to measure a teaspoon or two per the recipe they provide. Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely know homebrew shops who do that. Uh, not specifically like providing the uh, like the teaspoon or two of salt thing, but um, you know they have like the lo- they have a bunch of copies of the local profiles on hand. Yeah, right? like, I've they'll, seen they'll it have too. Printouts. Um, I've definitely seen that, and it's a great idea. Like, I definitely think they should because. And to your point, here's what I think. I think you're ultimately making two points here. The first is that water has a impact on beer, which I agree with. Yeah. Um, the other is that water is not as complicated as we typically make it out to be. And I also agree with that, uh, is that I, I really, I really strongly feel that once the doors open, it's really easy. Um, and it's, it's just getting the door open. That is, I think hard for a lot of people. Like, yeah. it's like how do I dive into this? Right. Uh, Water knowledge page on Bruin Water is a great one. Uh, and also RO Water is a great way to start that accessibility. Yeah. If you don't want to worry about uh, like worry, what is my local profile and am I adding enough Campton towers to get rid of the chlorine and the chloramine? Uh, like, you know, if you don't want to mess with that stuff, RO Water is basically zero. Get yourself some gypsum, <laughs> yeah. get yourself some calcium chloride and you're that's that's a all you need. You're done well, so so one of the the, the bold claim uh, Mr. Chuck Norris 10101 uh, made here is that he thinks that people would stick with the hobby 
longer. Uh, if yeah, if, I was purposefully ignoring that one. Yeah, I, yeah, um, but, I, but it's a, I, but it's a good point. <laughs> I, I, it I makes to me wonder. That. You know, it does. I I can't help but wonder how much of people brewing a batch or two and then being like screw this is because you know you kind of made a joke about chlorine being in the water earlier. It, it, it's chlorine, and and it, you know what it makes. Um, Something that I've thought about is like, I, you know, I can't imagine that these water, the RO water filters in front of the grocery store are terribly expensive. In fact, my guess would be that it's the, the water company will provide it for free. I see a big opportunity for at least big, you know, nicer homebrew shops that have decent uh, clientele. Uh, why don't they get those? And then they could sell, hey, there's go grab, grab your RO water and an extra five bucks, whatever. You're going to get your the amount that you need for your batch. And here's a little baggie of the stuff that you have to add to it to, to, uh, to achieve this specific profile to me that just makes yeah. so much sense eh, I, I get why people might not want to do that but uh, good point I'm not sure if, if it's water is the reason why people are bouncing from the hobby or keeps them in but I certainly do think that it impacts I, water. I do think it's fair I think the point he's making there is that you know especially I'll say the chlorine thing right especially with high levels of chlorine which is in most tap water um, and and can really lead to some strong chlorophenols and strong uh, phenolic it's off characters yeah. in beer so I, I kind of get the argument it's like look if you're unhappy with your beer but you've tried you've tried different recipes and you've tried different well, hot profiles like the fact that we tell people well your water doesn't matter so much as an early <laughs> brewer yeah it, if you're making beer you're unhappy with like that could be a major component of it is the fact that you are brewing with a ton of chlorine and that is obviously incredibly toxic for yeast and like it's yeah. just and generally it, bad yeah and it tastes bad so good points exactly uh, final comment comes from reddit user ccoch uh who asks how different is distilled water from ro water uh yeah it, it so it is um and it's also it's also a different production method yeah, right yeah. um distilled water is distilled go figure <laughs> um and so it goes through a distill distillation process and it is more pure typically than RO water. Yeah. Um, distilled water is going to be like total blank state, absolute zero. Um, RO filter because it in because it is like a membrane. It's it's possible for stuff to sneak through. Um, like I like I said with the TDS meter thing, like you get three to four TD. Like you you might get still some in distilled water. Theoretically, you should be at at zero zero like zero one zero, or zero. Yeah. Yep, that's my understanding. Distilled water is, in, in essence, for, for folks, I've talked to people who think distilled water is just boiled water. Uh, what it is, is no. it, 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 you can make your own distilled water. It's like, but what distilled water is, is capturing the evaporation from boiling water, in essence, and then, and then you know, allowing that to recondense, and, and then that's your distilled water. It is... About as it is about as pure as water gets. That being said, I do think that you can get away with distilled or 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 ro water uh, and and basically achieve the same results when it comes to brewing and beer. They are both blank slates. Uh, They're not that different, but they're they're made differently. So we can do that as our next experiment and. Just make sure it's a beer you like because they're going to be the exact same thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm making a bold claim now. I think Don Sig, <laughs> if we did that experiment. All righty, man. Well, that's the time, all the time we've got for this episode. Any finishing thoughts on RO water, Matt? No, man. I, I think we've covered it all here. Uh, that I, I really think that RO is a great way for people to like enter the accessibility of water and make it more accessible for people. Um, it's, it's definitely like it. Sure, it's a little bit of a pain to either collect beforehand or to purchase beforehand um, than just to take your tap water. But just being mindful about what you put in your beer is really part of the process. It's, yeah. it's you know, it's water is another part of your recipe, just like your grains are, just like your hops are. Um, so I definitely think be mindful about it um, and just give it a shot. Yeah, if you're yeah, exactly. If you're having issues with your beer and you want to try something, uh, a, a potential fix, go grab yourself some RO water, brew a batch up. Uh, you know, no pain, no gain. It's not that difficult. All right, don't forget to head over to brewlosophy.com to read up on the experience discussed in this episode as well as everything else we're up to the brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners we seriously could not do this without you cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show it makes a huge difference if you haven't yet please consider doing so head over to brewlosophy.com support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast if you want a reward for your support visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy thanks again for listening we'll be back next week with another episode of the brewlosophy podcast until then think beer Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it soothes my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through.